Good afternoon and welcome to Deep in History. This is uh, Marcus Grodi, joined as usual with Monsignor Jeffrey Steenson. Monsignor, good to have you join with me again as we walk slowly through uh, this uh, classic book by St. Irenaeus, the book Against Heresies. And we're able to do this, Monsignor, over the the blessing of, I guess it's a blessing, of this digital uh, technology that Irenaeus obviously didn't have, couldn't have imagined in any way, shape, or form way back 1800 and some years ago. Uh, We're going to, our goal today is to finish book four. So we're starting on page 434, those of you that are following along, and we're going to go through 447. We're going to finish, we're going to start with book four, chapter 37, section seven, and then we're going to finish all the way through chapter 51. Section four. And Monsignor, here's what I thought we would do, if it's all right with you. First of all, uh, especially those that are reading through the book, occasionally I would encourage you to just turn back to page one, which is the, the prologue to the entire book. It's on, like I said, page one. Prologue 1, Section 1, and just read that to remind you of why Irenaeus felt so motivated to do this. Because it says, for as much as there are some who, putting the truth away from them, introduce in its stead false tales and vain genealogies, and then it goes on and on, that here was a, a bishop in the midst of, of uh, heresies, scandals, attacks on the church. The devil was, uh, and his horde were attacking the truth from every angle. And he was using the technology he had available for the sake of his people and his fellow bishops to take a frontal attack on the heresies that were on these people. Yeah, no, uh, that's right. And uh, you've been commenting along the way about how sometimes the context of what we've been reading seems almost homiletical. Um, And I think what we're seeing here is the pastoral side of a bishop in the second century, um, they, they weren't sitting over great chancery staffs. They were, they were, they were right into it in, in terms of supporting their people pastorally and teaching them, um, you know, the faith. You, we're so accustomed to things as we are in our 21st century. I'm almost positive Monsignor that at the time he wrote this, Almost all the churches were in the cities. Yes, I would say so, yeah. There were no rural parishes, and all the churches in the cities were pretty much run by bishops. That's and, correct. And yeah. assisted by, but assisted by deacons and priests. So he's in a city of Lyon, and, mm-hmm. and that's it. And second of all, we have it in book form. But it's, especially in the section we're looking at today, it struck me more than any time throughout the book, and maybe because I just wasn't looking for it, but it struck me today that this was originally a sermon. It seemed to me this was originally written by Irenaeus to be proclaimed, and maybe he began this series because he was so uh, bewildered, if you will, or disturbed by the influence of these false teachers coming right to the front door of his church. And so he he took it straight on. And if you will, you could imagine it parallel to a bishop today with the, the, the craziness that's happening in our culture, taking it right to the airwaves without mm-hmm. any hesitation. 
And when you look at it that way, in fact, if you think of the whole book as maybe began as homilies, and then people said, hey, that's good stuff. And then so maybe they encouraged him to put it into a book. Maybe maybe that wasn't even his intent in the first place. It was a bunch of sermons. And then he begins straight off in your eye, appointing the heretics and what they're teaching. Right off. Today we read that and it's like, how do I get through this stuff? He was hitting the people just like if if a bishop were hitting the stuff that we're seeing on the nighttime news. So, so now that we're getting further into this book, into this work, um, I mean, like at the end of book four, he's talking about, he's got a plan. He's going to write five books. Right, right. So um, so he's, he's definitely um, out of the pulpit and into the study now with his yep. pen. Although I, I still think what he wrote, was preached before it came into the book. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I think so. Yeah, he I was still, so. now yeah. he was, at some point in this this whole book, he's now putting both his sermons together, but knowing they're going to be in a book. And those of us that have written a few books know exactly what it is. A lot of us, there's a whole bunch of books out there, and we know them, that they were originally individual articles in magazines. And then later they came together into a book. I'm guilty of that. I have a book called Thoughts for the Journey Home. Those were all originally mm-hmm. articles. I have a book called Life from Our Land. Those are originally independent articles. But I took the articles and then shaped them then into one flowing book. I think that's what Irenaeus probably did. Well, and that's perceptive what you've said, because one of the criticisms of, of his book is that it's, a little bit scattered, um, and that would that would be one way to explain it. If he was if he had begun simply by writing a book, um, there probably would have been a more organized um, argument through it all. It, so sometimes he you know he takes these diversions, and that it may explain, have been shorter. Yeah, it may have been a more condensed, shorter book. But he's preaching, yeah. and in those days. Again, we're used to 10-minute homilies today in the Catholic Church. Where I came from in the Presbyterian Church, it was a 20, I preached a 20, 25-minute at least sermon. In their day, this was the only entertainment in town. And so an hour-long message. And we see that in some of the homilies of Augustine and others, right? Some of them are, are quite long. Anyway, I think that's behind this. So be, I don't know when it began, but the the section beginning on page 434 with section 7, chapter 37, section 7, all the way to the end, in my mind, give kind of an overarching idea. It, it's it, To me, it could have been one homily pulling all of what he's been doing so far together as he gets ready for his final book. And as he says at the end of this section in chapter 51, section 4 on page 446, that book 4, whereas book 4 was a focusing on the Lord's discourses, book 5 is going to be focusing on the teachings of Paul. And you don't want to see, this is why I'm excited about the idea of thinking of it as a homily, because, I mean, in other words, his homily was mostly scriptures. Yes, yes. Each of these is mostly scriptures with his comments on the side. That's really what all these are. It's mostly yeah. scriptures. It reminds me a bit of, of St. Pope John Paul II's writings, were almost all scriptures. That's right. With oh, reflections that's a, that's on the side. Great, yeah. So, Monsignor, here's what I'd like to do. Okay. Um, and, and I want you to jump in whenever this windbag goes too long. But what I want to do is we have a tendency in the past, and I'm sure I'm the one that's always guilty of this, not you, but I'm the one, is getting too long-winded. And what I would like to do this time is I'm going to – do a quick overview of the entire section all the way. 
And then when we're through with that, we'll have essentially finished the whole book four. And then what I'm going to invite you to do is go back and pick okay. out some real important highlights. Because those, again, those of you that are reading this, there, there is, we could spend a couple more hours easily going through all the quotes that are of interest in this section. So he begins on page three, 434, excuse me, section 37.7, with the basic idea that Christians need to watch earnestly with might and intense struggling. And it's a section with some great quotes in it that he, he's got to the point about the necessity of struggling in our desire to grow in holiness. And he's, he's emphasizes that we need to be on our guard for the time for the time to come and to persevere in love toward him. Now, Monsignor, you point out that in book five, we're going to get into more his discussion about the end times. Yeah. But it's a common theme. He believes that that we're there's, there's urgency. All right. It's going to involve struggling, though, an intense struggling, basically as a Christian lives out the cross of Christ. And then he says in chapter 38, page 436, he's saying that somebody might say, well, wait a second, why didn't God just make man perfect from the beginning? What's with all this stuff we've been going through? I mean, that's, maybe he heard that from one of the Gnostic teachers. Mm -hmm. And he gives a, a great long answer, but it's the summary of it is that because, because, hey, man was unoriginated. And Monsignor, I'm going to have you come back and talk about that later. This okay. whole, uh, he uses this term a lot, right? Unoriginated and originated. The unoriginated. Because man was unoriginated, childish, strange, a babe. And in these last times, he came as we could receive him, as milk to babes. God chose that Christ would come in a way that we could receive him. All right? And then in section two, it's because of our imperfections that the Holy Spirit could not rest fully upon us. And there's a great quote in there that is one of the earliest quotes I can see that kind of refers to a confirmation type experience. Mm -hmm. We'll get to that. It's in section two. Christ came as a babe due to our childishness. Irenaeus talks about. I mean, I can't tell you, Monty, how many times in the 45 years of my ministry have I've heard preachers talking, trying to explain why he came as a babe or why he came in the way he did. And here's that's what Irenaeus is dealing with here. It's because of our, our weakness. Then in section three, he goes on, God created, he says that created man can endure all the struggling that we have to go through, through the power of the unoriginate, the unoriginate. Now again, Monsignor, why, why is he using this term? We're gonna, I want to possibly get to that in the context. Through the Trinity, man grows towards perfection. There's a, in there he talks about how the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all help us childish human beings who can on our own but through the Holy Spirit, can grow towards perfection. And in this section, Irenaeus gets into an issue that is uniquely a theological discussion amongst Catholic, tradition, uh, Catholics and Orthodox. It's not so common in, amongst non-Catholic Christians, non-Orthodox Christians, and that's the whole issue of deification. Mm -hmm. Deification. Uh, though Irenaeus kind of skirts the issue a little bit, he doesn't really de use the term, but we know it's biblical because it's in the letters of Peter in the New Testament. So here we see a whole discussion of deification. Then in section four, he addresses the fact, again, back to that question, why didn't God make us... You know, imperfect and make us perfect in the first place. In other words, why didn't he just make us gods? And he says that the impatient are unreasonable. They want to be like God now. 
But God, knowing our infirmity, had a better plan. All of this that that Irenaeus talks about in our need to grow in perfection involves patience and recognizing that God knows what's best for us. And then in section, in chapter 39, section 1, he talks about, he goes back to the two ways. And for a while there, Monsignor, I was wondering if maybe this was the beginning of his homily, but I, I think it all flows. And he, he talks about the fact that mankind learned the knowledge of good and evil way back when. It's a part of our creation. It's in our conscience that we might learn by trial and experiment so we can freely choose the best. Aaron seems to make such an important, as he did last week, about man's freedom to choose, the necessity of our freedom to choose. And he emphasizes here that <clears throat> the importance of us learning by trial and experiment. Through our senses, we have a model of how our mind learns what is good. Seeing, mm -hmm. hearing, he talks about that. So in other words, God, that's part of the reason we were given our senses, so that we can understand how we learn to choose between what is good and evil. But if a man rejects this knowledge that he's learned, he destroys his own human being. Those are the words of Irenaeus. When a man rejects the knowledge that we receive from God, we destroy our own human being. That, to me, Monsignor, that's a fascinating thought that Irenaeus was getting to. So now we're into ch chapter section 2 of 39. How then should God make man into a God? Essentially is what he's addressing. It, is, it involves us allowing God to reshape us. He Allow him to make us, to reshape us, which requires that we not be hardened. Monsignor, he talks about that, and he uses it as an image. This is a, a, the image of we're clay being shaped by the potter. And when clay becomes dry, no longer moist, it can't be shaped. And so he talks about the need for us to stay moist, if you will, to not become hardened. You know, how do we do that? Well, that's kind of what this whole section's about. There's a great quote in there, right, Monsignor, that God makes we are made. And I think Monsignor, that in just that short statement, Irenaeus says it a little differently, said it a little differently. He's, he's touching on a whole bunch of Gnostic false ideas. Bottom line, God makes. We're made. And if we are humble before him, he will perfect us. If we do not believe, obey, relent, it is our fault. And Monsignor, we've chosen that as the title for this yeah. episode. Yeah. Right? The, the emphasis about, hey, it's us. And, I, you know, Monsignor, I, in some ways I hate to for us to skim through this because I want you to address that issue. Because when he says that it's our fault, he's also addressing a lot of the false teachings of the Gnostics. Right? Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Okay. So we'll, we'll be coming back to that one. Great, great, great. Then we get into chapter 39, section 4. We're on page 441. And we, he's been talking all through the book, but often he doesn't always call it the two ways, of course. But he's talking about the two ways that we have before us, either follow God or we don't. And he's described this all the way through the entire book. But now he gets into the judgment of the two ways. Those who fly to the light, excuse me, those who fly from the light reap darkness through their own fault. That's a summary, if you will, of section four. Then when we enter into, wait a second, Monsi, what have I been doing wrong here? 
oh, I just noticed I put something wrong in my notes. And Monsignor, you didn't correct me. Well, I, I thought we were following. I was, we're, we're, we're on page 442, right? <laughs> 442. In my notes, I have this as chapter 50. Excuse me, everybody. This is chapter 40. I misread oh, the Roman sorry. numerals too quickly there. So we're going okay. through chapter 41, section 4 today. That'll finish. I'm sorry, everybody. Uh, so uh, on page 442, Monsignor, we're in uh, chapter 40, section 1. And this is where he emphasizes if, if, if the judgment that's been established, those that are faithful and obey God will be, in essence, recreated, reshaped, perfected, deified. Or if those that don't, there is judgment. He emphasizes that this judgment has to come by the one and the same Father. Otherwise, it ain't going to make any sense. Right? He, he, he's, he's addressing the confusion that the Gnostics and all their teachings even undercut the very understanding of what we'll face when we stand before God in judgment. It's got to be by one and the same Father. that comes the judgment of both ways. Section 2, chapter 40, section 2, the Gnostic views make no sense of the judgment. And he talks about that. But then he goes on, but one and the same Father makes sense of the parables of judgment. Christ's great parables make sense if they're one and the same Father. They don't make sense if one created Jesus and then one, you know, of the different things that are divided by the Gnostics. And he goes through all the parables of Christ. And sometimes we don't think of those as parables of judgment, but that's what they're talking about. The sheep and the goats, of course. The same, the same Father prepared both places. Chapter 40, section 3 and 443, he talks about the Lord, the, excuse me, the Lord sowed good seed, but the apostate angel tried to set it at enmity with God. But the incarnate Christ fulfilled the Proto-Evangelium, chapter Genesis chapter 3. And so, again, he pulls it all together. He's talking about the judgment. He's talking about the one Father and the one Christ and the incarnate Christ fulfilling what had been predicted in Genesis 3, that the, that the son of, of the woman would crush the serpent. And so he talks about Christ fulfilling that prophecy. And then in chapter 41, sections 1 and 2, we're on page 444, he, he just says it as it is. All who are in apostasy from God are of the devil. And he's very blunt about that. And this is where he talks about that the, the term son has two meanings. There are natural-born sons, and those who are made sons. And he says that by creation, yes, we are all children of God. Everyone. So again, if we looked at this whole thing, you know, we grow through struggling, perfection, through humility, God can change us, he can turn us in, he can be deified, and then, but it involves our choice, and which side we choose is our freedom to choose, and if we choose away from God, that's our own fault, and the Gnostics get around to this in all kinds of different ways. And then now he talks about sonship. And all of us, in a way, are children of God, but as to obedience in learning, not all are God's children, he is saying. I'm thinking about today's modern political correctness that wants, just wants to make everybody, no, 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 no. Yes, in a way we are. He's our creator. When it comes to obedience and learning, not all are God's children. Only those who believe and do his will are his sons. Those who believe not and obey not are children of the devil. This is Irenaeus saying this. Chapter 41, section 3, page 445. As is found 
In normal, customary life, those who disobey God are disowned and cease to be sons and lose their inheritance. And he's taking this from the example in real life. Yeah. If you got a son that's dis- that's disobedient, turns his back from you, he loses his inheritance. Well, the same is true in our relationship with God. But if, and here again, that's why this whole homily is pulling the whole book together because his goal is to convert the apostates. That's his point. So with all that he said, he's saying, but if they convert, if they repent, if they turn, and then if they rest from their evil ways, they might become sons and inherit incorruption. That's his goal. That's how he ends book four, brings one, two, three, and four together. And then in that very last section, last paragraph, in section four, he says, okay, I've finished this book, uh, which has been focused on our Lord's discourses, but now I'm going to do a book five which will focus on the teachings of Paul, as well as he said, Monsignor, and you pointed this out to me, as well as further reflections on the literal words of Christ and how they deal with that. Monsignor, before you jump into any comments on that summary, if you will. Oh, sorry, did you... I thought you had a question for me before. I, no, I was, oh, I was just going to okay. say, and before we jump into the, the, the main points, did you want to add anything to that overall summary before we jump into oh, some specifics? No, you did a good, great, great okay. job on that. I okay. think very thorough. Okay. Okay. Well, then let's back up, everyone. I, I want Monsignor now. There's so much we go through here, but what I wanted Monsignor to do, then take us back, Monsignor, to point us out a few tidbits that are particularly unique for what uh, Aaron Ass was saying in this end of this book. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much. Well, I, again, you will have to watch our time on this. So you just, yeah. you keep, you're the timekeeper on all this, but <laughs> um, you know what? I think you've already pointed out that um, he's, he really hammers home the point about, individual responsibility yeah. and how God creates us to be um, rational and free. Um, and, uh, and of course, again, his opponents, those Gnostics, are, are um, basically determinist in the way they look at human nature. Um, and we'll look, as we go forward, we'll see a few more points in this, but they they free will is not important for the Gnostics. Um, for the Gnostic, it is you. You are what you are. You know, you're either a son of um, the higher God, or you're an offspring of the lower one. Um, you know, and you know, you don't your, get to make the move. What's your thought, Monsignor? Thirteen hundred and fifty years later, or so, the reformers of the sixteenth century. Some of them are going to believe that Augustine is teaching depravity of the will and even that we no longer have free will at all. I, I know. I, I was meaning to ask you that very question because of <laughs> your Calvinist background, you know, but um, it it is fascinating. There is a there's a real, there's a, not a gulf, that's too strong a word, but there's a difference between Irenaeus and Augustine on how they approach this question. Remember, Irenaeus is basically an Easterner. Um, I, there is a difference between the Eastern and the Western fathers. Um, and, uh, and he, in the East, the, the freedom of the will is something in the East, Eastern patristic thought. That's something really fundamentally important. Um, Augustine kind of develops that argument that concupiscence distorts it. So we're always going to make the wrong choice because we're um, 
you know, selfish desires are what motivate us at, at core. That's our nature. Um, I was quite struck as I read this passage how Irenaeus, um, he keeps hammering home the point about, um, well, we were talking about a title for it, and I came up with, with um, the, the prefer, you know, it's colloquial <laughs> title, um, it's your own damn fault if you go to hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's very clear on that subject. See, I would, you're you're far more patristic scholar than I am. I mean, you, you know more in your little finger than I, I, I'll i ever even, oh, no. even forget, you know. So, but you make the distinction between the Eastern Fathers and the Western Fathers. In my readings, I'd almost want to make more of a different kind of distinction that it seems to me that the emphasis on the freedom of the will and the and the responsibility and our freedom to choose it comes down to that not denying grace not denying grace because he talks about grace but still the end is we have to respond to grace mm -hmm. to me that's an earlier concept not so much east and a west, but an earlier concept that eventually uh, developed a way, if you will. And the, one of the places that I see that is, and you're the scholar with, not only are you the scholar on Athanasius, but I can almost, I just sense you have Athanasius sitting within arm's reach over there. But when, Arth when Athanasius writes the biography of Anthony in the desert, Anthony sounds almost Pelagian in our responsibility to choose God. And it seems to me that I had read a book recently on Pelagius, the only reason I know that, and it almost seems that in Augustine's, in many of those in the 5th century, overreacted to these ideas of freedom, maybe because of other battles going on, to emphasize the, our depravity to, if you will, preserve our need to surrender to God completely and, and emphasize it's all him and not us. Where that wasn't so much an issue for Irenaeus or even Anthony of the dev, Desert, because they were emphasizing guys kind of kind of like in uh, uh, John's letters in the opening of the book of Revelation to the seven churches. Hey guys, you got to re recapture your, your original love here. You've gotten off base. You've become lax. You get off your, your butt and, and go out there and live your faith. That was more the emphasis in, in you know, I, Oh no, that's, that's, that's true. I, Augustine probably learned most of those ideas about, um, free will and human nature from his mentor, St. Ambrose. So that's where I think we began to find it emphasized in the Latin patristic tradition with Ambrose. And I, I don't know, I mean, it's a mystery in a way how, I, I guess Ambrose and Augustine were basically dealing with the question, you know, if it is so clear cut as St. Irenaeus says it is, why would anyone in their right mind choose to live an evil rebellious life. And, um, and I, you know, I think Augustine, as he develops the idea, he's saying, um, well, really ultimately it's, it's not free will because we lost that in some sense, we've lost that that has to be restored because of original sin. So we're, we're now enslaved, we're enslaved and, but it's interesting, Marcus, the other thing I, I've also been struck by is um, when Pelagius was stirring up a storm in Rome and then his disciple went down to Carthage and got things going there, um, they, the Western fathers drove them out. Council of Carthage, um, yeah. um, for instance, that was probably the prim primary one. Where did they go? They got on a boat and they went to the east. <laughs> and the Pelagians were more or less well received by the eastern bishops, uh, because 
I think this is just a very different approach from uh, east to west on this question. I, I'm almost hesitant to put this on tape, but I was reading recently some uh, debates between Catholics and non-Catholics about justification, sanctification, all those issues. And the more I listen to them, the more I'm reminded of Irenaeus, because I wanted to scream, guys, you're just, you're just fighting over words. Yeah. You're just fighting, you're distracting away from what is the bottom line. The bottom line is believe in God, do his will, who gives a rip with the chicken and the egg thing. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's about being obedient. On the bottom line, Revelation says, and I just was at a funeral. We will be held accountable for what we do in this life. All the other distractions or excuses, it's not my fault. In fact, some of the theologies, it's God's fault. He didn't predestine, oh, exactly. he didn't predestine me to be saved. It's not my fault. Well, and it's interesting, you know, his, I mean, the Gnostics, they were going around saying that... Um, you know, it's just the way it is. It's whoever we were, you know, if, if you descended from the good God, um, well, some of them then went on to say that, you know, morality is not all that important because that's just all stuff done in the world. So you have a lot of this antinomianism amongst the Gnostics. Um, you can do whatever you want in this body because it doesn't count. It's yeah. not... It doesn't matter, you know. And some, so he's definitely dealing with that question. Yep. Um, yep. And you could tell, you know, he's obviously responding to the Gnostics. They're questioning him because, you know, he's saying, you know, we have to take responsibility, and we, we, the moral life is something that um, is is laid upon us. And the Gnostics say, well, why didn't God just make us perfect in the first place then? Yep. Um, that's, <laughs> I think that's the context of all this. Yep. And, and so he, he, you know, as we'll see a, a little bit further down, he opens up the idea of these two senses of sonship. Because yep. the Gnostics want to say that we're just, we're sons of God naturally. Um, so that depends on kind of, I guess, on which God we're descended from because, <laughs> oh. you know, they've got the two. So, right. all right. So we better push on, huh? Sure. Um, so what I, I think the next thing we might want to look at is, is, um, on, on page 438, that question of deification. Okay, before you get Unless there. Unless you want to do any more here. No, no, no. Real quick, I just okay. want to jump yeah. 437 right in the middle, right next uh -huh. to that little um, reference to Acts chapter 8, the sentence that says, As then the apostle was able indeed to give them the meat, parenthesis, for on whom they laid hands, they received the Holy Spirit, which is the meat of life. Under parenthesis, I just want to point that out that there aren't no, too, good... there aren't too many references in the early church to confirmation. Yeah, the sacrament of confirmation that developed later, and there's a debate between the East and the West, but in many ways it was a part of the baptismal. That's right. Entrance into church, but at some point you either keep them together or make them separate. But the idea of the anointing, the anointing and the laying on of hands and the receiving of the Holy Spirit, there we see it. It's, we're not saying that Irenaeus was a was referring to confirmation because I don't know Monsignor if there's any reference to that at all this early in the church. Mm -hmm. No, I think yeah. it's not. It's at this point it is not separated. Okay, all right. Two. Yeah. All right, Neil, deification the next, on the next page, Monsignor, is to me a, a big issue. All right. So let me, uh, let me begin by, um, as a Protestant, when you hear that word, deification, what's your visceral reaction to it? 
back in the old day, I would yeah. have, because of my particular formation, there was no, I had no mental file folder for the idea of deification. And the only group, in fact, I wasn't even aware that Catholics had this a part of their theology because I never heard Catholics talk about this. You know, I think recently in the last 10 years, uh, Ignatius Press has put out a wonderful book that Carl Olson was at least part editor, if not part author, bringing together a lot of the teachings on deification. I think your average Catholic doesn't even think about this as a part of the beatific vision. I would have, the only group that I thought of as a Protestant that had anything to do with deification were the Mormons. Because the Mormons yeah. teach that we become gods. At least I think they do. That when we die, we become gods of our own planet. I think that's what they taught. Fascinating. So in that sense, well, the Mormons, yeah. uh, you know, Joseph Smith was almost, he must have been a, an early patristic scholar. <laughs> I think that's the first time I've ever heard that. That's interesting. <laughs> well, <laughs> but well, even yeah, you know, there is a there's quite a, a history of this question about deification. Um, we find it more in the Eastern Fathers than in the Latin Fathers, but obviously, it's there. And I think the first thing, Marcus, if I could do um, is just remind people if they haven't ever been to it is to go to the Catechism of the Catholic Church to paragraph 460. And there we we find, I, they actually quote, um, the Catechism actually quotes St. Irenaeus hmm. in that. Um, it, the word became flesh to make us partakers of the divine nature. So that, of course, is... Uh, 2 Peter 1 4. Right. Okay. For this is why God, this is why the Word became man, and the Son of God became the Son of Man, so that man, by entering into communion with the Word and thus receiving divine sonship, might become a Son of God. It's interesting. That is a direct quote from St. Irenaeus, um, Book 3, uh, 19 1. So the catechism directly quotes Irenaeus there. Yeah. And then it goes on to say, for the son of God became man so that we might become God. Do you recognize where that's from? I, I was going to say, is, uh, is that Augustine or Ambrose? I couldn't remember. Um, no, that's St. Athanasius. Oh, uh, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So. There it I is. Just pull it out. Um, by the way, if, if people want to have a magnificent experience, um, get, a, get that little book on the incarnation of the word by St. Athanasius. Um, the one that's published by St. Vladimir Seminary Press is the one I recommend because that's the one that has the preface written by C.S. Lewis yep. on the reading of old books, which, um, is what we're doing here. Yeah, you can get that from we're Amazon. The it's clean available. sea breezes of the centuries blow through our minds, so <laughs> clearing them out. But in in on the incarnation of the Word, in in chapter uh, fifty four, in section three, Athanasius says uh, about Christ: He was made man that we might be made God. Um, and the Word. Not that anyone needs to have a lecture on the Greek words, but um, um, divinization is translated. In the Greek, the word that's used is is um, theopoiesis. Um, and and basically the the idea is that we don't become God in a in a, in the proper substantial sense of that word. Um, we can't. We're created. But um, but we're able to see him. We're able to live um, immort live in, in immortality, um, so that we can be his children forever. Um, 
basically we become his sons and daughters um, uh, through this process of, of theopoiesis or de deification. Um, and um, anyway, there, that, those words um, that I read from St. Athanasius, um, they, they become really a part of the tradition now. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you hear I, I think it's just, a, it's marvelous how we get, we meet up with it here in Athanasius. I mean, in Irenaeus for the first time here. And I still make this emphasis and I'm hesitant. I'm, uh -huh. I, I don't want to well, go ahead. try and claim any expertise in, in the fathers at all. But I, I believe in my reading of Irenaeus so far that unlike many of the theologians in the centuries that will come, he is doing everything he can to stay within the boundaries of Scripture. And any extrapolation he takes from that in his interpretation, he's doing nothing but staying tight to Scripture. I think. In fact, not even using terminology that isn't scriptural. But that's why, if we talk about deification, he's interpreting Second Peter. He's using Scripture. And so when we read, for example, in section 4, page 439, whereas we blame him for that we are not from the beginning made gods, but first men and then gods. Yeah. So St. Irenaeus is, is unapologetically just saying it there. He didn't make us gods first, but he made us men first, and then gods. That's the deification that's in Second Peter. And you talked about sons, 1 John chapter 3. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. It does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's what you were talking about, Monsignor. There's the mystery of what this is. We, we don't know in this life, but we will be like him. And we'll, we'll um, I, 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 maybe I'm jumping a little ahead of us, but you asked the question about, um, where were we? It was a couple of pages up. You were asking the question about, um, I thought I wrote it down here. Um, Begotten and unbegotten, or oh yeah, using those phrases, the, those in, that language. Uh, if you look back to page four thirty eight, four thirty eight, the second. Uh huh. The, by this order, then, and by measures such as these, and by this kind of training, man being un be, man being originated and formed comes to be the image and likeness of the un originate God. So this, this word's originate and unoriginate. Okay. And I was looking at, uh, on page 436. Okay. Um, uh, section one. Um, but if a man say, how is this? Could not God render man perfect from the beginning? That's the Gnostics question. Let him know that although unto God, who is always the same, and unoriginated in respect of himself, all things are possible. Yet the things which were made by him so far that coming afterwards, they have each their own beginning of generation. So far they must also fall short of him who made them. Um, so, you know, uh, can I use the two Greek words again here? <laughs> because... I can't tell you how hugely important they're going to become in the next 100 years, 150 years. Unbegotten, a genetos, and begotten is genetos. Um, so um, the question during the Council of Nicaea in the Nicene period, there was a tremendous argument about 
how could Christ be of the same substance of the Father if he was begotten? Um, well, it's a very complicated philological thing, and I won't bore everybody with that, but it becomes a really important point. And, yeah. and the Arians are basically drawing on this older way of speaking about begotten and unbegotten, that you can't have, they're totally different substances. And the unbegotten creator and that creation which he begot can't be the same. So something's got to, something has to happen there too. And he, Irenaeus brings in the language of adoption basically um, so that we, you know, are trained so that we can become uh, worthy sons of God. Um, but we, of course we can never become no. of the substance of the unbegotten one. It, um, it well, makes... anyway, the, the Nicene fathers had to work that out and they, they basically, it was, they added another N to the word, um, yeah. begotten. Um, so Christ is, Christ is begotten, but he's not originate. <laughs> he doesn't have a beginning. Um, and so he is, Christ himself is unbegotten in the, in the sense of a genetos with one N, but he, he's not in the sense of two ends because he's got a father that has begotten him. I, I know that's incredibly complicated stuff, well, but it's uh, to me, um, it's important in this sense. And I know I've emphasized maybe too much, you know, that in the centuries that follow Irenaeus, there's so many divisions in the church over battles, over the meaning of these words. Yeah. And the devil used that to bring division. And to this day, you know, people are divided. But the truth is, if you will, this was caused by the, by the coming together of the canon. Because there was a time when church over here only had the book of Matthew. That's the only one they saw. It's the only one they heard on Sundays. And then the church way over here, it had a letter from Paul that it read on Sundays. And the church over here had a letter, supposedly the Acts of James or something, and they're reading that on Sunday. And then a book over here, you know, they had Galatians that so they were reading on Sunday. And then this, they had a, they had a book called Hebrews. They were, And so as long as they were in reading individual things, it wasn't causing a problem. But when yeah. they put all these together into one thing, all of a sudden the, the language in Matthew and in John and in Galatians and in Hebrews and in James didn't always jive. And yeah. there are lots of times when they talk about God the Father and then the only begotten Son and the Holy Spirit. And well, how do you put these together? That became the issue. How do you put these together? By the way, you know, when when you want to have some fun with this, um, if you go if you go back to Athanasius again, um, he he has a fascinating point at the very end of that section that we were looking at um, that I read from, where basically he says, "This is all a mystery, and it might be better if we just don't talk any more about it." <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> Because you pointed that out, you pointed that out several times, you know, that we shouldn't be, you know, so involved in all these words. Um, so but in, in section 54, um, he, he just says, uh, better it may be then not to aim at speaking of the whole, where one cannot do justice even to a part. But after mentioning one more, to leave the whole for you to marvel at. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> let's just let's just be thankful and, and stand in awe of the wonderful gift that God gave us. You know? Irenaeus is taking a shot over the bow at this point in time, warning them, guys, don't you be careful here. Don't don't yeah. forget charity. Don't forget charity. And when that was lost, then um, we're at fifty-five minutes, Monsignor. A couple one one I wanted to emphasize 
and then maybe this is where you'd like to go, is the beginning uh-huh. of, of chapter 40, the very first paragraph there. Okay, all right. Where it says, There is then one and the same Father who for those who thirst after communion with him and persevere in his obedience hath prepared the good things which are with himself. But for the prince of apostasy, the devil, and for those who shared in his revolt, hath prepared the everlasting fire into which the Lord and said those should be sent who are severed off towards the left hand. Of course, he's referring to the parable of the sheep and the goats. You know, there he's just saying straight off that division of the two ways and the judgment that the one and only Father has prepared. And that's right. And that that um, idea of preaching the two ways, which is so much a part of how the early Christians um, approach yeah. this task, it goes right to his argument here um, that there is both reward and punishment. And um, because God created us to be free, he does not compel us to choose one way or the other. Yeah. Um, we get what we have chosen and what we justly deserve based on our choice, uh, whether we choose obedience or disobedience. It's fascinating how he, he, he I just, I just can imagine how, you know, he's dealing with these Gnostics that are saying it's all been predetermined ahead of time, who's in and who's out. Yeah. Um, and, and there are Christians today, lots of them, that believe <laughs> that very thing. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've mentioned on this program that in uh, in fact, not far from here, when I was a Presbyterian pastor in a church, yeah, I don't think it's more than 20 miles away from here, small country church, that I remember a woman, lifelong Presbyterian, who was always sad because she, all her entire life, believed she was of the unregenerate, that she had been of the unchosen, and there wasn't anything she could do about it. So she could just go and do what she needs, what she wants to do. Well, that no, but yeah, but that's yeah. not how she felt about her life. She desperately wanted to be close to God. She wanted to be of the chosen, but she believed in her heart of hearts that she was not of the predestined. She was not of the chosen, and there, there, and I tried to tell her, look. If you have a desire for God, that in itself is a sign that you're of yeah. you've been given grace. Respond. It's your free choice, as Irenaeus says. She yeah. couldn't go there. She could not go there because of what she that's began. Fa- yeah. Fascinating. Oh no, that's well, you know, Marcus, the other thing we talked about before the program a little bit, um, perhaps we should just point out too is just go back a page or so, um, 439 two on page 440. Um, yes. And, and he, here he's introducing this idea of, um, of sonship, if you will. Um, and you know, um, so the, so you can be a, a natural son or you can be, an adopted son, or you can be a natural son, but you can lose your inheritance. And that's the context of this. And he, he says in section two there, um, how we must, um, be, well, the, we must yield, uh, we must be plastic to our master's hand. In other words, um, um, we have to be open to how God leads us and how he shapes us. And the whole experience of salvation is um, is a discipline. It really jumped out at me, those were all those words there. Page 40, 45. In the nature then, which we have by creation, we are, so to speak, all children of God, because we are all created by God. But in respect of obedience and learning, not all are God's children but such as believe him and do his will. As for such as believe not and do not his will, they are the children 
and angels of the devil. And again, he's not saying a person said, uh, remember that old uh, Flip Wilson, the old comedian back in the 60s, 70s, you know, the devil made me do it. Uh, yeah. kind of a thing. Yeah. You know, that's yeah. not what he's saying here. He's saying, you know, if you didn't choose God, it's the devil's fault. No, you're choosing to be on the side of the devil. That's his point. And, you know, I you, you made a, a point earlier, Monsignor, and, and maybe we ought to bring it to a close here. Uh, okay. Um, in fact, um, he's talking... Uh, in page 446, at, at the end of three, but as long as they believe and persevere in allegiance to God and keep his doctrines, they are sons of God. But on falling away by transgressing, they are enrolled under the devil as their prince, under him who first to himself and afterwards to the rest became the cause of apostasy. So not only is it our choice, but it requires perseverance. It's, this is a yes. lifelong journey, folks, by grace. You know, if you, if you don't recognize that it began with grace, and grace empowers us to choose and is always there when we ask for it, Grace, he's always there, but there's the mystery of all along. It's a both and. All along, we are always free. As, and as he, Irenaeus said in what we talked about last year, God does not coerce. It's always free. So there's, we, and I know I've said this before, it's one of the main things that separates Catholics and maybe Orthodox and Catholic Orthodox, is this emphasis on the both and, the mystery of the both and. Too many Protestants get caught up in the either or. It's either the sovereignty of God or the freedom of man. You can't have both. And we would say, there's the mystery of the both and. Yes, they are both. And that's kind of where he's saying here. Yeah. And, you know, and also, you know, I think we we're, we all struggle with this in terms of... Um, uh, the catechesis of the, the next generation of Catholics. You know, we've had this problem now where kids get baptized and they get confirmed and then they disappear. And somehow the message had been sent that, well, you've, you've, um, we've done all that we need and you're now, you've got your ticket punched. And Irenaeus would be horrified with that way of thinking. It's it is it's a lifelong journey, and it requires discipline. and um, And if it's neglected, it can be lost. Let me throw out an idea as we're closing, Monsignor, right along with that very thing, because you mentioned earlier that some people wondered why why would anyone not choose God. Mm. Why would anyone not choose to be with Christ when when the two ways seem so clear? And and especially today, why 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 do people choose? Why don't they choose the gospel? Why don't they choose the blessings of the gospel? And my personal view is that what's happened over the centuries is that slowly, but slowly, but slowly, there's an aspect of the gospel that's been set aside as if it's not an essential aspect of the gospel. And that is the central primary issue of the gospel is the cross. It's the cross. If you will, from Adam up to Jesus, we have a whole mess of people that turn from God. When Christ came, he came to pay the penalty for the sins of humanity. So God made this radical, absolutely radical decision to send his son to die for the sins of the world. God so loved the world that he sent his son. All right. And then we have the arrogance to think, well, he paid it all. Now we have nothing but joy. Mm. 
And that's not what Christ said. When you read the Sermon on the Mount, you read all of his teachings, you, you read the teachings of the New Testament teachers, you read it in the Irenaeus, is that it involves struggling. That the time of the church is a time of living the sufferings of Christ. And to the extent that we do that, we are in Christ. I, you know, one of the most important verses, if you will, Monsignor, that summarizes what we've talked about is Romans 8, where Paul says, when we say, Abba, Father, it is, we have received the, son, the spirit of sonship. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is the spirit himself bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. The gospel involves suffering and struggle. So if you're really remembering and trying to live the gospel, and we recognize that being a, a follower of Christ might mean martyrdom, following Christ might mean rejected, following the Christ might be renouncing all things, he says in Luke 14. If that's what it is, then you might understand why some people might say, you know, it looks like the way of the devil's easier. Look at the wealthy. Look at the privilege. Look what they've got. You guys are over here denouncing and detachment and simplicity and say, I'll go with them. That's what, the, remember, the book of wisdom, the book of Sirach, the book of, they're all about the wealthy. And so, but the problem is that over these centuries, over time, we think that, that, that the suffering of the Christian life is only for the few. In fact, gang, we only do it 40 days a year. It's a thing called Lent. Yeah. And that Lent only involves a little bit of sacrifice. I'm going to give up artichokes. <laughs> I'm suffering for Jesus. The truth is that the 40 days of Lent are remind us what the centrality of the gospel is. It is the cross of Jesus Christ. Right, Monsignor? Amen. I think Irenaeus was saying that. I think we're just summarizing what Irenaeus is trying to say. Yeah, no, that's right. All right, Monsignor. How about closing that's this good. with a prayer, Monsignor? All right, okay. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, <laughs> Lord, may everything we do begin with your inspiration, continue with your help, and reach perfection under your guidance through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Monsignor. Hey, thank you, Marcus. And all of you, thank you for joining us on this episode of Deep in History. We look forward to joining you next time when we're going to begin, finally, Book 5 of Against Heresy. It's an incredible that. milestone. <laughs> <laughs> we weren't sure we'd get it in before the second coming, but we'll get to yeah. it next week. See you then. <laughs>